Hi everyone, I'd like to welcome you to tissue oximetry monitoring in the ECMO patient. My name is Larry Garrison and I am the Chief of Cardiovascular Perfusion at Franciscan Health in Indianapolis, Indiana. And my disclosure is that I am a paid consultant of Edwards Life Sciences. So many of us have been using tissue oximetry monitoring for a number of years uh, during cardiothoracic surgery to interrogate cerebral oxygen saturation. The rationale being that as clinicians, we are tasked with continuously evaluating the effectiveness of the intervention we are providing. But it is less often that tissue oximetry is used outside the cardiac surgery suite, and even less so in the intensive care unit. However, we have found that utilizing tissue oximetry during ECMO to evaluate oxygen saturations in the vascular beds of cerebral and skeletal tissue provides us with a more comprehensive picture of the total oxygen supply demand balance. However, I'm gonna take a slight step back here. And for those who are not familiar at all with uh, NIRS tissue oximetry in general, in a bottom line nutshell type of approach, what it is is utilizing near infrared spectroscopy to assess the oxygen saturation of vascular beds underneath a self-adhesive sensor that is applied to the skin and interrogates up to 2.5 centimeters beneath the sensor. And since the measured values are most affected by changes in the venous oxygen saturations, these values represent a mechanism to evaluate the DO2 VO2 relationship. The NIRS system we use is the Edwards Foresight Elite system. And one of the reasons being is that it possesses an algorithm that is tailored to the unique optical properties of both cerebral and skeletal muscle sites. It compensates for the effects of skin pigmentation and melanin. And as an absolute tissue oximetry device, the sensors can be applied at any time, whether the patient is anesthetized or not. So for the somatic or skeletal muscle tissue application, on the middle and left of your screen, you can see factors that affect oxygen delivery, things such as hemoglobin concentration, the percentage of arterial oxygen saturation, cardiac output, and so on. And on the far right side of your screen, you can see some of the factors that can affect oxygen consumption, such as fever, shivering, depth of anesthesia, et cetera. These uh, lists are not intended to be completely exhaustive, but they do represent some of the more common factors involved in the DO2-VO2 ratio. And for cerebral applications, added factors include those physiologic elements on the supply side, that affect cerebral blood flow, such as PCO2 and mean arterial pressure. And on the band side, there is the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen consumption, or CMRO2, and those elements that contribute to an increase or decrease of the same. And this is a snapshot of the factors that could potentially increase regional cerebral tissue oximetry values such again as hemoglobin, arterial saturations, cardiac output, mean arterial pressure, et cetera, as well as a range of values that can be used as a guide to let you know when you are in a safe zone indicated by the green area and when it may be necessary to evaluate potential causes of values outside of that green 60 to 80% range. And during VA ECMO, because we are dealing with both native and extracorporeal arterialized circulations, <clears throat> it is important to ensure that both are functioning to accomplish the same goal, which is to deliver oxygen-rich blood to the cerebral and somatic tissues. And again, we have a graphic that at a glance can help to identify those factors that may contribute to an increase or decrease in cerebral uh, blood flow as well as a cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen consumption. Those things include pump flow and FDO2, ventilation of the native lungs via the FIO2, the sweep gas of the ECMO circuit, as well as the ventilator settings that contribute to PCO2 values. And now I'd like to get into a few case examples of what has just been presented. 
So back in 2012, Wong and others reported that cerebral saturations as reflected by a near infrared spectroscopy have observable changes on VA ECMO with cardiac recovery, sometimes presenting in an ECLS manifestation of Harlequin syndrome or North-South syndrome. If the heart recovers prior to the pulmonary tissue, the location of the mixing of the oxygen blood or the oxygenated blood from the ECMO circuit and the deoxygenated blood from the lungs and ejected by the left ventricle, which becomes a watershed region, progresses from a point prior to the origin of the head vessels, which is the aortic root and, and ascending aorta area, to a point distal to the left subclavian artery in the descending aorta or even in the abdominal aorta. Manifestations of this phenomenon, as you can see on your screen that's taking place, may include one or more of the following um, and in terms of a decrease of SpO2, reduced SCVO2 and or SVO2 values, the presence of or increase in arterial and pulse pressure waveforms, decrease in pulmonary artery wedge pressure due to an increased left ventricular ejection fraction, as well as a decrease in the values of the cerebral saturations. However, given the appropriate intervention is provided, and which you can see just it took place on the screen, the incidence of cerebral ischemic event can be mitigated. Consequently, and as advocated by many, continuous cerebral oxygen saturation monitoring during VA ECMO not only provides a tool that may be help or may, that may help to predict cerebral injury, but alerts clinician to the need for an intervention. And as you can see, the cerebral oxygen saturations responded to the mitigation that was provided. And what that mitigation is in, in your hospital and in your setting is entirely up to you, but we, the, the advocation is to mitigate those events. And this is just a pictorial of what the distribution of deoxygenated blood shown in blue and oxygenated blood shown in red could look like during a North-South or Harlequin syndrome. So that was an example of what can happen to the cerebral saturations during a potential ischemic event that was mitigated by being notified that the watershed region or mixing cloud was progressing through the aorta by means of cardiac recovery prior to pulmonary recovery. But what if the ischemia were to happen in a peripherally cannulated leg? Well, as early as 2012, it was recognized that near infrared spectroscopy monitoring of the distal limb perfusion was in fact effective in detecting distal limb ischemia. Distal to the femoral artery cannulation site, tissue perfusion may become compromised over time. And to that end, Bonacolini and others in 2019 narrative review of the existing literature noted an incident rate of distal limb ischemia in peripherally cannulated VA ECMO ranging from 10 all the way up to 70%. Further, and if left unchecked, distal limb ischemia can lead to acute compartment syndrome or ACS and can manifest as increased distal tissue perfusion pressure decreased skeletal muscle tissue oxygenation. And in addition, ACS is temporarily or, or associated in a time-dependent manner with an increased risk of amputation. As such, the goal of the clinician is to monitor and mitigate these events when possible, such as the event that just take place on the screen. And as tissue oxygen saturation monitoring device, NIRS is well suited to the early identification of distal limb ischemia. Matter of fact, in the 2018 report, Patton Rivera and others were not only able to identify when distal perfusion was compromised due to the interruption of normal blood flow from the placement of the peripherally placed cannula, they were able to identify the, the false presence of the false positive Doppler. These are important things to take in consideration when peripherally cannulating a VA ECMO patient. And in a pictorial presentation, you can see that the compromise of blood flow shown in blue to the left leg <clears throat> as detected by the drop in skeletal muscle saturation by NIRS. 
And in this example, the decrease was nearly half, but as you saw, the ischemia was mitigated and as a result, the saturation in the left leg beneath the sensor returned to the pre-ischemic values. So in the final example, I'd like to share with you is of a weaning a VV ECMO patient. And this segment can be put into the weaning how we do it category. Um, in addition to tissue oximetry and for a comprehensive understanding of these patients, from the time we initiate VV ECMO, we utilize advanced minimally invasive hemodynamic monitoring via flow track to also simultaneously assess hemodynamic parameters. Because as the people in this audience are fully aware, assessing ECMO patients for their ability to be weaned can be somewhat of a dynamic process and may be best individualized to each situation. Nonetheless, there are specific tests that we perform to assess readiness to wean quite regularly that utilize both cerebral and skeletal muscle tissue in IRS. And one of those tests is a deoxygenation challenge, which you just saw started on the screen. So to advance to the deoxygenation challenge, our protocol is that the patients must have passed our assessment and O2 challenge test. And if all criteria is met, we then proceed. We begin by holding all other patient and ECMO variables constant and decreasing the ECMO circuit FDO2 by 10% increments every five to 10 minutes, down to a minimum of 25%. What we are looking for at this point is hopefully to see that the patient is capable of compensating if necessary, but not to a point that it may become dangerous. So we look at both the cerebral and skeletal muscle tissue saturations, heart rate, mean arterial pressure, entitled CO2 and SpO2. And we do this because even if their cerebral saturations and tidal CO2 and SpO2 remain somewhat normal, as it has in this example, the skeletal muscle tissue values suggest that the test needs to be terminated because by all appearances, global oxygen delivery has in fact been compromised, even if the patient tells you that they feel okay. So what the NRF get, NIRS gives us is another tool besides what we have traditionally used to easily and non-invasively assess the readiness to wean. So to recap, cerebral oxygen saturations during VA ECMO can help to notify clinicians of the need to mitigate ischemic events associated with cardiac recovery prior to pulmonary recovery, otherwise known as Harlequin or North South syndrome. And in peripherally cannulated VA ECMO, one study reported a 12% incidence of distal limb ischemia requiring fasciotomy, even in the presence of a prophylactically inserted distal perfusion catheter, which emphasizes the importance of monitoring oxygenation in the skeletal muscle tissue beds. And finally, assessments for the pulses and Doppler sounds can be subjective and may allow hypoperfusion to go undetected. However, near-infrared spectroscopy, skeletal muscle tissue oximetry, monitoring is, is both accurate, reliable, and it is objective. And with that, I would like to thank you for tuning into this presentation, and I will be happy to take your questions during the Q&A session.